السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد as to what proceeds respectful students of knowledge in Al-Islam in this blessed month the month of Ramadan during this time we are currently studying the text by the great Indian scholar and muhaddith known as Al-Allama Al-Nawwab Siddiq Hassan Khan Barahimahullahu Ta'ala The text which we are studying is from the book Wasilatul Najat and in our previous meeting Siddiq Hassan Khan Rahimahullahu Ta'ala mentioned the fawaid or the benefits of fasting. The Ahlul Ilm or the people of knowledge have mentioned many different and various benefits of fasting. Siddiq Hassan Khan rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned four. He mentioned that there are four distinct benefits for acts of ibadah that are done in the month of Ramadan. The first benefit that he mentioned is that the first is the act of zakat. Everything has its own zakat. In regards to this fasting, then it is viewed as zakat of the body. So this is the first benefit that he mentioned. He said that every single act has a zakat that must be given. And the zakat of the body is to observe fasting. In regards to this fasting, then it is viewed as zakat of the body. So this is the first benefit that he mentioned. He said that every single act has a zakat that must be given. And the zakat of the body is to observe fasting. The second benefit that he mentioned is the act of patience, sabr. As Ramadan requires the individual to demonstrate patience for the sake of Allah. As the fasting person abstains from food, drink, marital relationships, and any shameful act or any action that is disliked by Allah, the fasting person aims to abstain and prohibit him or herself from doing such an action, like backbiting, namima, stirring up, etc. The third act of ibadah that one can benefit from in the month of Ramadan is the act of participating in the acts of ibadah and residing in the masjid during the night of al-qadr, the night of decree, as this act is of great reward. As we all know, khayru min al-fisha, better than a thousand months. 
So one of the benefits for the, in the month of Ramadan for the male or the men is to participate in different acts of ibadah, which could include talab al and to remain and reside in the masjid. The fourth benefit that can be mentioned is that the final act one may benefit from is the performance of qiyam, qiyam or Ramadan, which refers to standing in prayer. As this holds great rewards, as some of the ahadith which we have covered have stated that standing in the night prayer, observing the night prayer, erases the minor sins of the individual. All the minor sins are forgiven for the one who observes the night prayer. The night prayer is a sunnah which is emphasized, has been emphasized and encouraged by the Prophet ﷺ. It is not something which is obligatory. So there is no sin upon the one who does not observe the night prayer. But the least that can be said about such a person is that the person will deprive him or herself from a great reward and a great opportunity of getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are benefits that we find that Al-Allamatu An-Nawwab Siddiq Hassan Khan Rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned in the chapter of fasting in Wasilatul Najat. I wish if somebody was to gather these benefits and publish them for the benefit of those who did not attend this lesson so that those who did not attend and were absent can benefit from these benefits which Siddiq Hassan Khan rahimahullah derived after studying hundreds of books of the scholars. As we know that Siddiq Hassan Khan was a great reader, but even when he was performing Hajj, he did not abandon reading. So then, Siddiq Hassan Khan, rahimahullah, states, he moves on to uh, another issue. So he's talked about fasting in the month of Ramadan and everything that was discussed previously. Now he moves on to a different issue. Siddiq Hassan Khan, rahimahullah, states, it is also important to note that it is not allowed for a woman to keep the voluntary fast without the permission of a husband. This is derived from a hadith narrated by Abu Huraira عنه, in which Abu Huraira narrates that the Prophet وسلم, stated that لا يحل لإمرأة أن تصوم وزوجها شاهد إلا بإذنه ولا تأذن لرجل في بيتها وهو كارم وما تصدقت مما كسبت فله نصف عجر صدقتها It is not permissible for a woman to be fasting without her husband's permission. And he is witnessing it, meaning he knows about it. And she is not permitted to let another man enter her house, and he dislikes that. A man here refers to somebody who is a mahrafah. And whatever she gives in charity, from that which she has earned, she will obtain half the reward for it. It is not permissible for a woman to be fasting without her husband's permission. And he is witnessing it, meaning he knows about it. And she is not permitted to let another man enter her house and he dislikes that. A man here refers to somebody who is a mahrafah. And whatever she gives in charity from that which she has earned, she will obtain half the reward for it.
This is the hadith which Siddiq Hassan Khan rahimahullah ta'ala was referring to. The last part of the hadith which says that if a woman was to give money in charity from that which she earned then she would get half the reward for it, not the full reward, the half reward for it. As this has been mentioned, Tidhi Hassan Khan, he mentioned this hadith in Tabarani Fil Awsat. This narration has been mentioned by At Tabarani in Al Awsat, Al Mu'jam Al Awsat 282. What does the last part of this narration mean? وَمَا تَصَدَّقَتْ مِمَّا كَسَبَتْ فَلَهُ نِسْفُ أَجْرِ صَدَقَتِهَا Whatever she gives in charity from that which she has earned, she will obtain half the reward of that. The people of knowledge, they have said that what this means is that وَمَا أَنْفَقَتْ مِنْ نَفَقَةٍ مِنْ غَيْرِ أَمْرِهِ فَإِنَّهُ يُؤَدَّى إِلَيْهِ شَطْرُهُ Siddi Hassan Khan rahimahullah he mentioned this hadith which has been narrated in by At-Tabarani in Al-Mu'jum Al-Awsat and the hadith is gharib we find that in the Sanad or in the chain of transmission of this narration which uh, Siddi Hassan Khan rahimahullah mentioned that all the narrators that can be found in the Sanad are all rijal which are thiqat and they are from the Rijal of As-Sahih. In Sayyid al-Bukhari. Except that Muslim Ibn al-Walid and his father, nobody has verified or classified their integrity except for Ibn Hibba and his thiqat. And Yazid Ibn Abdullah Ibn al-Hadi is the only one that narrated this hadith from Muslim ibn al-Walid, ibn al-Ribah. That's why the hadith is gharib. So some of the people of knowledge have made some kalam on this narration, but there is a shahid for this narration, which can be found in Sahih al-Bukhari. Hadith number 5195, as I found. Where Abu Huraira again, anhu, similar narration which states, that the Prophet Sallallahu said, لا يحل للمرأة أن تصوم وزوجها شاهد إلا بإذنه ولا تأذن في بيته إلا بإذنه وما أنفقت من نفقة أن غير أمره فإنه يؤدى إليه شطره Abu Hurairah رضي الله عنه said that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said it is not lawful for a lady to fast voluntary fasts without the permission of her husband when he is at home. And she should not allow anyone to enter his house, anyone except with his permission. And if she spends of his wealth on charitable purposes without being ordered by him, he will get half of the reward. He will get half of the Reward. So this is what it means. وَمَا أَنْفَقَتْ مِنْ نَفَقَةٍ أَنْ غَيْرِ أَمْرِهِ فَإِنَّهُ يُؤَدَّ إِلَيْهِ شَطْرُ So the hadith which was mentioned in الْمُعْجِمُ الْأَوْسَتْ وَمَا تَصَدَّقَتْ مِمَّا كَسَبَتْ Whatever she gave in the charity in which whatever she earned or obtained is referring to the wealth that was given to her from by her husband. If she spends that without seeking his permission, then he will get half of the reward. Because the, in reality, the wealth that she is spending from is the wealth of the husband. The narration which Siddiq Hassan Khan quoted is the narration that he said that can be found in al mujamul Awsat for Tabaran. I brought you that narration with its wording. But the wording which Siddiq Hassan Khan rahimahullah mentioned, I could not find that wording. This is what Siddiq Hassan Khan said. Siddiq Hassan Khan said, women who keep fast without their husband's permission, if their husband's intended for, for something and she refused, due to her refusal, 
she will have three major sins written on her scales. This is what Siddiq Hassan Khan rahimahullah, mentioned with regards to this narration. I could not locate this narration with this wording in At-Tabrani Al-Awsat with this wording of three major sins written on her scales. So the hadith with Siddiq Hassan Khan rahimahullah, mentioned Al-Mu'jum Al-Awsat of At-Tabrani then the hadith is sahih, as it has been reported, there is a shahid for it in Sahih al-Bukhari, Mustad Ahmad, Sunan Abi Dawood, Al-Jami'ah, Al-Kabir of Al-Tirmidhi, and Ibn Imaji, and others. And the, the scholars have said, and have verified the narration to be sahih, it is enough for us to know that the narration can be found in Sahih al-Bukhari. The next issue, which... Siddiq Hassan Khan Rahimahullah Ta'ala mentions So Khulasatul Kalam Before we move on to the next issue Is It is obligatory upon the Wife to fast in the month of Ramadan She does not Need to seek Permission from the husband (laughs) If she Fits the criteria of fasting then it is obligatory upon to fast. Other than the months of Ramadan, if the wife decides that she wants to observe fasting, voluntary fasting, again voluntary fasting keeps coming in, then she must seek permission from her husband. If she fasts without seeking permission from her husband, then she is sinning in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next issue which we are going, which Siddiq Hassan Khan rahimahullah discusses and Siddiq Hassan Khan rahimahullah states, he says, doing iftar in the month of Ramadan, why traveling is an azima. The first uh, end of the speech of Siddi Hassan Khan Rahimullah. So Siddi Hassan Khan Rahimullah then brings a, a third issue. The third, the second issue was with regards to women fasting voluntarily. Now he's talking about not fasting. I mean, doing iftar whilst traveling, meaning break, not fasting Whilst you are traveling, this is an azima with ayn. So Sidi Hassan Khan here is going to discuss something on the basis of usul, usul al-fiqh. So you have an azima and you have a rukhsah. Azima with ayn and a rukhsah. Sidi Hassan Khan says that the Legislated decree when it comes to fasting whilst you are traveling is al fitr that you don't fast. So azima means that the original ruling for fasting whilst traveling is that the traveler doesn't fast. This is what, what it means, azima. This is what al azim means. So, what is the ruling for a person who is traveling with regards to fasting? If a person was to fast, was to travel in the month of Ramadan, what is the actual ruling that has been revealed in the Quran and legislated in the Quran for him? Oh. Is that they don't fast. This is the azima. Azima is its original ruling. Then the Shaykh, rahimahullah, he says, after mentioning this, he says, for the one who has the physical strength and capacity, then it is a concession, rukhsah. So Ruhsa is a concession in comparison to Azim. Meaning, the person has a choice.
to either fast or take the concession and be exempted from fasting in that circumstance, meaning whilst he's traveling. But it is better that even while having physical strength and capacity, one should not keep the fast. End of Siddiq Hassan Khan rahimahullah ta'ala speech. So this is how Siddiq Hassan Khan rahimahullah has explained the issue of traveling in the month of Ramadan and with regards to fasting. So Siddiq Hassan Khan rahimahullah, he says, Al-Iftar or Al-Fitr whilst traveling in the month of Ramadan is the Azim. With regards to a person who has the physical strength and ability, then he may fast due to his own or due to her own choice. And if he does so, then this is a ruhsah. But according to Siddiq Hassan Khan, rahimahullah ta'ala, it is better not to fast. This is Siddiq Hassan Khan, rahimahullah's position. Let this be noted. This is the position of who? Of Al-Allamat Al-Nawwab, Siddiq Hassan Khan. Al-Iftar fi safar is the azimah. فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيدًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ This is the Azim in Surah Al-Baqarah. But if a person has physical strength, has the ability, capability, capacity to fast, then if he fasts, then he is taking a ruhsah a concession. But according to Siddiq Hassan Khan, it is better not to fast. So if Siddiq Hassan Khan was traveling with us, he would adopt the view of not fasting. And in my lecture before the month of Ramadan, I discussed the scenarios, the different scenarios of when a person is traveling should he fast or should he not fast? And the different scenarios. Because if anybody of you students were present, then they will know that I mentioned this issue. But we're now talking about Siddiq Hassan Khan. So Siddiq Hassan Khan is position, from what we understand from this, is between the Zahiriyyah and the Ahlul Hadith and Al Madahib Al Arab. So we have the Zahiriyya and we have the Ahlul Hadith and Al Madahib Al Arba, the four famous schools of fiqh. Before we discuss that, what does Siddiq Hassan Khan rahimahullah, bring as his evidence? Siddiq Hassan Khan rahimahullah, after mentioning this, what I just mentioned, he states that in a hadith narrated by Ammar ibn Yasir, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it is not righteous that you fast on a journey. So Allah has granted you a concession. So accept this concession. This is the hadith which Siddiq Hassan Khan rahimahullah mentioned on the authority of Ammar ibn Yasir. So as his evidence, he brings this narration. Now when I searched this narration once again, he mentioned it, he said that this narration has been mentioned in At-Tabarani Al-Kabir and the Isnad is Hassan on the authority of Ammar ibn Yas. And when I searched At-Tabarani Al-Kabir, I found a narration on the authority of Ibn Amr. Um, narration number 13,403. And I only found this part of it, the first part of it. I could not find the second part of it. Where Siddiq Hassan Khan said, Allah has granted you a concession, so accept this concession. I could not find this narration with this wording. But I did find 
on the authority of Ibn Umar, that the Prophet Sallallahu said, لَيْسَ مِنَ الْبِرِّ أَسَّوْمُ فِي السَّفَرِ That it is not righteousness that you fast on a day. So Siddiq Hassan Khan mentioned that this narration is from Umar ibn Yasir. And Umar ibn Yasir narrated this narration in At-Tabarani al-Kabir. I found the narration from Ibn Umar. And I found the wording, لَيْسَ مِنَ الْبِرِّ أَسَّوْمُ فِي السَّفَرِ And that's it. The additional wording that this is a concession that has been granted to you by Allah, so take the concession. This additional wording I could not find in At-Tabrani Al-Kabir or any other source that I researched into. The hadith which Siddiq Hasan Khan rahimahullah ta'ala is indicating towards with the source of At-Tabrani Al-Kabir we can find another hadith which is a shahid for this in Al-Bukhari on the authority of Jabir ibn Abdullah hadith number 1946 where Jabir ibn Abdullah said وَرَجُلٌ قَدْ عَلَيْهِ فقال ما هذا فقال سائم فقال ليس من البر الصوم في السفر الله عز وجل صلى الله عليه وسلم was on a journey and saw a crowd of people and a man was being shaded by them he صلى الله عليه وسلم asked them, what is the matter they said he the man is fasting the Prophet ﷺ said it is not righteousness that you fast on a journey so this is the narration which the asal of it of which Siddiq Hassan Khan rahimahullah has mentioned in At-Tabrani al-Kabir with the Isnad being Hassan can be also found in Sahih al-Bukhari. The Zahiriya say that it is impermissible to fast in the month of Ramadan whilst you are traveling or whilst you are traveling even other than the month any other month other than Ramadan, even in the month of Ramadan. And if a person is to fast, then his fast will not be valid. And it will be obligatory upon him to make qada or to make up that fast. This is what the Zahiriya believe. This is the position of the Zahiriya. Where the Prophet ﷺ said, لَيْسَ مِنَ الْبِرِّ أَسَّوْمُ فِي السَّفَرِ so the Zahiriya say, they point blank. They say that not that iftar whilst traveling is an azima, and you have to go by the azima. فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيدًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفْرٍ فَإِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَامٍ أُخْرٍ To strengthen their case, they bring the narration of Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhumah. Where the Prophet ﷺ said when he saw that man being shaded, he said, لَيْسَ مِنَ الْبِرِّ أَسْوُمُ فِي السَّفْرِ They say, there you go. Not only do we bring you the azima from the Qur'an, but we also bring you the statement of the Prophet ﷺ. Hadith can be found in Sahih al-Bukhar, the authority of Jabir ibn Abdullah عنهما, and also as quoted by Siddiq Hassan Khan, quoted in Al-Mu'jum al-Kabir of At-Tabarani. So the Zahiriya will not fast whilst they are traveling. And if they, if does, if anybody does fast, they will say to them, you have to make up that fast. They cling on to this hadith. So we ask them, what about the narrations which can be found that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fasted whilst he was traveling? They said that the ahadith, all those narrations which you find with regards to fasting of the Prophet ﷺ, observing fasting whilst he was traveling, are mansukha, are abrogated. Because the Prophet ﷺ, on the occasion of Fatḥu Makkah, the conquest of Makkah, and that is the last that has been reported from the Prophet ﷺ, that the Prophet ﷺ was not fasting. They said, what do you say with regards to all the other narrations? They say they're all mansukha, they're all abrogated. 
Are you following the, the position of the Zahiriya? And what the Zahiriya say? So they say that if you bring them any other narration which says the Prophet ﷺ, when he traveled, you know, he fasted, or the Prophet ﷺ was asked, should I fast? Somebody, one of the companions asked him, should he fast or should he not fast? They say they're all matsuha. They say that the, due to the occasion of Fatih Makkah, which is the last occasion, which is one of the last things that the Prophet ﷺ did. Almost the Prophet ﷺ traveled in Fatih Makkah, he was not fasting. Az Zuhri said, وَإِنَّمَا يُؤْخَذُوا بِالْآخِرَةِ فَالْآخِرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم That which should be taken is from the last of his affairs. We taken is that which is the last from the last of his affairs. Meaning, we should go by not fasting as the Prophet Sallallahu did. But, other than the Zahiriyyah, Other scholars, they said that we don't accept abrogation. Zahiriya is a madhab of fiqh, just like the Hanafis, Shafis, Malikis, Hanbalis, and the Zahiris. They are, they are a fiqh madhab, a madhab, a school of thought in fiqh. Is that clear? So if somebody is asking who are the Zahiri, one of the, the Imam was Imam of um, Dawood al Zahiri. Contemporary with Imam Ahmed. And the one who popularized the Zahiriya Madhab is Ibn Hazm. Okay, just like any other school of thought in fiqh. The other people of knowledge, the Ahlul Ilm in response, they, another group of scholars, they say that we don't agree with you with regards to making the claim of a nusk of abrogation. Because reconciling with the conflicting reports is very easy. And there is no need to resort to abrogation when reconciliation and combining all the narrations and coming out with contextual rulings is possible. So this is the, another the group of scholars they say. And this is the, 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 the scholars of the four madhabs, the Hanafiya, the Shafi'i, um, the Malikiya, the Shafi'i, and the Hanabi. With regards to the Ahl al-Hadith, then Siddiq Hassan Khan, rahimahullah, very nicely summarized the position of the people of Hadith. With regards to the Ahl al-Hadith, then Siddiq Hassan Khan, rahimahullah, very nicely summarized the position of the people of Hadith. And bi ta'ala, I shall reiterate that at the end. The schools of Fiqh of the famous four madhabs, the Hanafiya, Malikiya, Shafi'i, and the Hanamila. And other than that, they said, what did they say? They said that reconcile between the narrations which may seem to have a, an apparent conflict with one another. They say that the prohibition of fasting whilst traveling and that it is not righteousness to travel is in relation or with regards to a person who becomes extremely tired or exhausted that he may faint due to heat or due to tiredness. But for the one who does not fear any form of tiredness or being exhausted, or if he fasts, he will not feel that he or she is fasting and will not become tired, then fasting for that person, that particular person in that particular circumstance and situation is better for him not to fast. And by this, you reconcile between all the nourishments rather than holding on to one 
particular narration and letting go of all the other narrations. Do you understand? So that's what they say. So in, in, in conclusion, I said, like I said, when I delivered that lecture, if you are a person who is traveling and if by fasting you're going to be exhausted and tired and it's going to be difficult, then you should not fast. If you're a person who has strength, physical strength, and if you fast, you know you will not become thirsty if it's hot. If you travel, you will not become tired or that you may feel that you need to break your fast. And fasting is better for you. For example, if a person was traveling and he took a small domestic flight, 45 minutes or so, and he knows that a 45 minute flight is not going to make him tired, then it would be better for him to fast. So the Zahiriya, they say, no, they don't accept. The Zahiriya say that it's haram. And they hold on to that one particular narration. The madhab of the people of hadith is that if somebody claims something to be abrogated, for them to say that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the occasion of Fatah Makkah was not fasting. And this is evidence for everything that the Prophet said before that or allowed that is abrogation, then you need explicit proof which is not available here. Because the other conflicting reports show that there is a context and a circumstance behind how the Prophet permitted to somebody to fast and how he did not permit somebody to fast. So by this becomes clear that reality of this issue is like I mentioned is that fasting for the person who is strong and will not get tired or be exhausted then it is better for him to fast fasting for a person who is going to f- feel hardship and hardness and exhaustion and tiredness then it is not permissible for him to fast and the one who is reluctant to accept the concession, then it is better for him to not fast. And the one who has no issues at all, no hardship at all, then he has the choice of either fasting or not fasting, that's entirely up to him. And this is when you read the words of Siddiq Hassan Khan, rahimahullah, you see that the Ahlul Hadith are in between the extremes. He said, listen to the speech of Siddiq Hassan Khan. For the one who has the physical strength and capacity, then it is a concession, ruksa, meaning the person has a choice to either fast, meaning take the concession and be exempted from fasting in that circumstance. But it is better that when, even while having the physical strength and capacity, one should not keep the fast. That is that Sidi Hassan Khan is saying that the mother of the Ahlul Hadith is halfway between the mother of the Jamahid and the Zahiriyah. According to Siddiq Khazan Khan, he says, if you do have the physical strength and the capacity and you're fast and you're taking the ruqsa. But if you don't take the ruqsa, then this is better for you. Even if you have the strength. This is the position of Siddiq Khazan Khan. Rahimahullah ta'ala. And this is what the Ahlul Hadith say. That it is better for you to follow the guidance of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Fatih Makkah that the Prophet did not fast. Then you should not fast. But if you do fast, then we cannot invalidate that fast just like the Zahiriya. This is where the difference between the Ahlul Hadith and the Zahiriya come. They invalidate the fast, whether it's obligatory or voluntary, whether it's in the month of Ramadan or any other month. We say, no, don't fast whilst you are traveling. And if you do fast whilst you are traveling, then you have taken a ruhsa, not the azimah. The azimah is that you don't fast. If you do fast whilst you are traveling, if you don't have the physical strength, then you can't fast is haram. But if you do have the physical strength and you do fast, then you've taken a ruhsa, not the azimah. This is what the Ahlul Hadith says. This is an issue, fine issue of usul al-fiqh if you understand. So we say the azimah is not to fast. So it's better for you to take the azimah, which is the asr. But if you do take it, then you've taken the ruqsa. You haven't taken the azim. 
And, and this is the position of the Ahl al-Hadith with regards to fasting whilst traveling. So I will stop here then for today. And hopefully we'll meet again on Tuesday, next Tuesday. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shura la ilaha ila anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayka.